Hi, welcome to Our Church. My name is Tim Jorgensen. I'm one of the pastors here at Our Church, and I'm so glad you guys joined us this morning. Uh, today, I am going to give a message, and it's going to go in lines with what uh, Pastor Tim has been talking about, uh, Pastor Tim Sadler, uh, along the lines of the battle, and because we are in a battle. The, the battle is, uh, whether you like it or not, you are engaged in that. Um, unfortunately, humans, uh, they are, sometimes they are, they, we don't ruffle, wrestle against flesh and blood, but sometimes humans are, they are sometimes uh, pawns, sometimes they are collateral damage, and sometimes they are the prize. Ultimately, uh, God is for you. He is fighting for you. The Lord is a warrior and he is on your side. And so what we want to talk to you guys and prepare you for is the, the battle that we are engaged in and how to, how to wage that war uh, victoriously. Um, God does not have plans for your defeat. God does not have plans for you to uh, be uh, um, put under. Uh, God wants you to go over, that you are the mighty warrior with the Lord. And, and so I, this morning we pray, as this, you hear this message, that you will be strengthened and encouraged uh, to follow the Lord, to walk in His ways, and to see victories in your lives and those that are around you. Because your victories are not just for you, but for the legacy of those who follow after you. Other people will reap the rewards for the victories you win today and, and, and the times to come. And so, Father, right now we pray for this message. We pray that this message will enter in the hearts and minds of those that, that hear the word. Father, we thank you that the word goes forth and it is it prospers in the thing whereto it is sent. Father, there's people out there that are listening to the sound of my voice that may have discouragement or they may be in the place of they may be collateral damage and or they, they may be the prize that the enemy has his eye on that he's trying to uh, defeat because he knows the, where their destiny is. And Father, he's trying, trying to, uh, the enemy's trying to stop that before that happens. So, Father, right now, we, we, we uh, pray for those people, Lord God, that they, right now, that a bubble of protection will go around them. And, Lord God, they, are, they will be sealed. And, Lord God, they will have the tools to win in Jesus' name. I thank you that you are fighting for them. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. So, as, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we are uh, continuing this message on uh, the battle that we are engaged in. And in, if you listen to the previous messages, uh, Pastor Tim Sadler has uh, given us some great tools and keys on how to wage war victoriously. And so I encourage you to, uh, to listen to those messages, to watch them, and make sure to get those truths inside your hearts because uh, you will need them. And the enemy comes, he doesn't come just to destroy you, he comes for the word. And so the, the word that you get is going to be the key to victory. And if he can steal the word from your heart, that's where he's going to win his victory. So if you get that word inside your heart, you, you have what you need to win. Amen. Amen. So uh, again, the battle that we're in right now is not a battle over uh, in society, in the world today, is not a battle over opinions. Um, it is a battle ultimately over truth it's a battle over truth and ultimately it's over the battles over the manifestation of the highest attributes of god manifesting in the earth so uh jesus prayed that his will will be done on earth as it is in heaven that is why jesus came to earth is to make sure that we would see god's will done on earth in heaven not just to bring people to heaven but to also bring heaven to earth. I know that's a, that's a big statement, but that ultimately is the purpose. And so heaven was, was not the, the ultimate goal, but, the, but see God's kingdom come uh, to earth and to see his will done on earth. Otherwise, why would he ask us to pray that? Not, not that it would somehow hope it would be, be done. Why would he say that? He actually is giving us a, a keys that I said, this is my desire, is that his will is done on earth as it is in heaven. And so that is the battle. The battle is, the enemy doesn't want that to happen. Does, the battle doesn't want God's kingdom to come to earth. The battle is that the enemy doesn't want God's attributes to be mass, manifest. He wants the, the world to lie in darkness where the light of God is, is shadowed and it can't be seen. It can't be manifested. 
And you're like, well, how can the enemy do that? Well, the enemy can do that through lies. Through lies and through darkness and, and, and through deceiving people of what God has done and what God has revealed in the earth and to try to hide that, to steal that, and, and to uh, lie about what God has done, ultimately. All right. So the key is getting is is partnering with God to see this comes come to pass. God does not do this thing by himself. If God is not just by himself. He came to earth to bring many sons to glory, not just to send his son, but also to redeem and and many many sons and daughters. And so they can work with him and bring out his glory, his truth in the earth. All right? So uh there, James 4, 7 talks about a, and we'll start there with that verse. And so it, it's, it says, Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee. Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee. So that is a, that is a tactic for victory, is, is submitting to God. It doesn't say, I know we, we sing songs about surrendering to God, but that all, that's not God's design. His design is you to submit to God, not just surrender. Surrender is like, hey, don't arrest me. I give up. I'm not going to fight you anymore. That's, that's, doesn't, it doesn't say that. It says submit. Submit means that you're not just giving up. It means here's God's will, his desires. You line up your will, your desires with God's desires, and you work with them together. That is, that is how you submit to God. And the question is, Submit what to God? Resist the devil with what? And that is what we're going to talk about today, is your will. Submit your will to God. I don't think you understand. I don't think we all understand the power that God has given us through our will, through salvation. And we're, we're getting into that more. But let's, let's, uh, let's take a step back into the, how God first created us in Genesis chapter 1. This was how God originally designed us. So this is important to understand. It says here, Genesis 1, uh, verse 26 to 28, it says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that is on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them. And God says to them, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. From the beginning, from the beginning, man was meant to have power to change their circumstances. I'm going to say it again. From the beginning, man was meant to have power to change their circumstances. That was God's design. And so uh, in this passage, there are two blessings that God gave to man. Number one is that he created them in his own image. No other creature did he do this. He says, man, I'm creating you in my image, in my likeness. You are going to have my image on you. You are going to be uh, uh, a representation of me on the earth. That's a great, that's a great privilege. And that's never been taken away. It's meant it's tried to be corrupted, but ultimately that is what what uh, God has intended for you to have His image, and that's the way He created you. And second, second of all, in this again, the foundational blessing is that not only were created in His image, but you were to have dominion. You're meant to have power and to make overruling choices that can change your environment for the better. For the will of God to be done. Amen? These two blessings were meant to go hand in hand. All right? So uh, Genesis 3, obviously, that changed that situation. So the enemy uh, uh, you know, deceived and, and man misused, or rather disused, um, the authority given to him and submitted his will to the devil's will. We see the anger that God had toward this in an uh, uh, Let's see, Luke chapter 8. Luke, I'm sorry, Luke chapter 4, verse 8. It says here that uh, when Jesus was being tempted by the devil, one of the temptations was that uh, he, uh, 
took him up to a high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the, of the world. And he says this, he says, And the devil said to him, All authority I will give to you and their glory, for this has been delivered to me. Who delivered to him? Man did. Not God. Man did. By submitting his will and stuff to God, submit it to the, to the enemy. And I give it to whoever I wish. Mm. And so this, and watch this. The next verse gives a glimpse into the Lord's anger over the situation. He says, get behind me, Satan. For it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only you shall serve. And I believe the, ang the, the anger of the Lord was over, over two things in that situation. Number one, he was angry that the enemy was using what was belonged to man. That dominion, that belonged to you. That belongs to man. And the enemy is the one that's, that's making the choices in the earth. And he's like, this is never the way it was meant to be. I, I gave that to, the, to man. And here you stole it and you're using it. That was not God's, that, that's one reason that, that uh, Jesus was angry about that. Number two is that not only had the enemy stolen his, uh, st stolen the dominion, but now the enemy was trying to steal the worship that could only go to God. He's like, it's not well enough that you have, you know, dominion over the earth, but now you're trying to take worship? Get behind me. And so, uh, yeah, this no other temptation re recorded in Luke 4 elicited such anger. And this passion was fueled by the mission that Jesus had to redeem mankind and bring back what uh, and bring back what was originally given to man, the dominion and also the, the image of God through Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Amen. So that salvation. That salvation that Jesus came to bring brought one of the greatest freedoms to mankind. And I've already hinted, hinted at this, but is the unchaining of the human will. It is the unchaining of the human will. Do you realize this? So what is real power anyways? So let me ask you that. What is real power? Okay. So fundamentally, power is the ability to make decisions. Amen. So it is, it, it is ultimately the power to make decisions in your environment. Think about it. So uh, the most wretched prison is when you have all the desires, but no power ultimately to make choices based on those desires. That's what ultimately prison is. And so uh, it's, it's very, and that's ultimately what hell is. Hell is you have all your your mind, your will, your emotions, your, your feelings, all these things, but you have no power to fulfill them in a good way. You have no, it's, everything is unfulfilled. Now, heaven is completely opposite. In heaven, you have all of your emotions, all of your, your imagination, all of the good parts of your memory, uh, your intellect, all these things, and they are fulfilled to their fullest in the best ways possible. His will is done on earth as it is in heaven. His will is done ultimately in heaven. And, and so it brings all the best parts to fulfillment. That's, that's when power is best used, is it brings the best things to fulfillment. So uh, unfortunately, many Christians, if you hear the words that come out of their mouth, they talk about the power that they don't have all the things that are going wrong and that they complain about. And, that, and God hates complaining. That's one of the top things he hates is complaining is really a confession of powerlessness. It's a confession of, of, of that God is not in this situation, that God doesn't have power in this situation. Every time you complain, you deny the reality of the goodness and the, the power of God every time. And that's why complaining should have no voice in your life. Complaining must be silenced. There's only room for thanksgiving, for joy, for prayer, for, for declarations. That should be in your voice, in your mouth. And so uh, in Paul in Romans chapter 7, he talked about where uh, this feeling that many Christians seem to voice. It says here uh, in, in Romans chapter 7, For we know that the law is spiritual, 
All right, because they, again, they, this talk about the desires that they're not able to fulfill. The law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For what I'm doing, I do not understand. For what I will to do, that I do not practice. But what I hate, that I do. If then I do what I will not to do, I agree with the law that is good. But now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. For I know that in me, that is my flesh, nothing good dwells. For to will is present with me, but how to perform what, I good, what is good, I do not find. For the good that I will to do, I do it not do. But the evil I will not to do, that I practice. Now, if I do what I will not to do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. I then, I find then a law that evil is present with me, the one who wills to do. For I delight in the law of God according to the inward man. But I see another law in my members, war against the law in my mind, bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. O oh, wretched man uh, that, I, that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? All right. Now, up to this point, he's, he, you th people think, well, that's, that's normal. That Paul, the Apostle Paul, he dealt with this. He knew the feeling of it. But that wasn't the end of the story because he, he goes into Romans chapter 8, starting in, in just a second here. He says, I thank God. Who delivered me from the body of death? I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So there is a deliverance. But um, uh, so with the minus of the law of God, with the flesh of sin, but there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk, war, do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Hallelujah. This passage again tells the, the torment of a will that, is, that, ha, that was once bound to sin. It wants to be a good gatekeeper. It wants to do the right things, uh, it, but is bound to the desires of the flesh. However, now through the death and burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ for, for the sin of all mankind, the power of sin is broken. Now your will has regained the power to choose. It is God's greatest gift of mankind and the devil's chief desire, the control of the human will. Just like in, in the Garden of Eden, his chief desire, he moved through all the, the things of, of uh, um, uh, trying to seduce the human will through uh, mind, will, emotions. Uh, he tried to get all the, the imagination, the intellect. He tried to do everything to get one thing, that human will, to, to make a choice for him. So now when Jesus has set us free. His will, his uh, chief desire is still the same. He's like, I've lost it because of Jesus dying on the cross. But now, because he said it's finished, but still I want ab, ab, uh, to, what's, what's that term? Ab, ab, you know, to hide it. <laughs> he wants to hide that, that fact that mankind's been set free. And again, get that human will to act in the way that he wants. And, and the way that he, uh, he chose. So he can't do that like he used to. He can't used to, so he's still using his, uh, his seductive input to the um, uh, different parts of the intellect, the imagination, the emotions, um, the, uh, the memories. And so he's trying to get that seductive input in there, and so to, which the Bible calls temptation, to try and get them to do what he wants to do because he can't do it like he used to do it. And so he's losing his grip. He's losing his power. And so he, right now, is trying to convince the new creation that their will is not powerful. And that's what I'm trying to do in the time I have here. I want to show you how to use the power of the recreated human will to, uh, to strengthen it and to make choices that win victories in your life. Amen? All right. So, uh, yeah, so Ephesians 3, uh, 20 says this, that now to him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. Again, this scriptural understanding of that God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all we ask or think according to the power that works in us comes after that we receive the, 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 the scriptural understanding that we are strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man. And at that point, uh, it, again, it goes back to Ephesians chapter one, 
is that our eyes of our understanding are enlightened so that we know what is the hope of our calling, so that we know what is the riches of His glorious inheritance in the saints, and we know the seeing greatness of the power toward us who believe. So our renewed mind connects with the power of the human will, and then as we, we connect with that through the renewed mind, we, we can see what we're able to do through the power of our will. And that's where the enemy is trying to uh, do his subtle attack. So he, and one of the major ways he tries to do a cell attack is through religion, is by downplaying uh, the force of a believer's willpower. And you've all heard this. And again, you've, you've, I've heard it, you've heard it. It's, if it's God's will, it will just happen. Is that true? Does God's will always just happen? You know it's not true. You know, you, they say, well, you just can't make God's will happen. You know, if God wants his will to happen, it will happen. That's what Islam believes. That's just not what, what Christianity believes. Christianity believes that God is working within us, both the will and to do of his good pleasure. But if you don't allow God to work in you to will and do his good pleasure, is his will going to be done? No. The fact that he, Jesus, again, going back to the beginning where I start talking, if we don't pray God's will is done on earth as is in heaven, why would he say that if God's will is automatically done? No. We have to pray. We have to partner with God to see his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, again, can you want something that's not God's will? Of course. Of course. That's, but, however, the power of salvation, the power of the word, and the power of spirit is working so that, and this is the beauty of salvation, is that our nature is being transformed, again, by the renewing of our mind, that we're able to, to prove was that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. So salvation uh, not only sets our will free, but salvation transforms our nature to want what God wants through us. Isn't that awesome? And so it's more likely that the desires that we have are ultimately God's will. That's more likely the truth, is that he wants, uh, he, he wants his will to happen, and he, and he stirs up our desires to want what he wants. Amen? And that's, that's a beautiful life. That's a beautiful thing. So, now, as, and this comes, again, as you, you put your spirit first, you, you, you start, again, uh, you, um, you submit your body to God as a, as a living sacrifice, renew your mind, and then you're able to prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. But this is the key. This is the key to victory, that your will must unite with God's will. That's why James 4, 7 says what, what it does. It, that was written to Christians. Therefore, submit yourselves to God. Submit to God, resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. Because we have a choice. We have a choice to submit. Um, we have a choice not to submit. And so God's going to put desires inside of us that are for his will. But we can't let our fears and the things that, that uh, the society tells us, uh, the things that our family may tell us, things that our body may be telling us that are against God's will, God's word and, and, through, and his revealed will, we can't let those things uh, blind us from knowing we can do what God wants us to do, his good, perfect, pleasing will. Amen? So our will must unite with God's will. And that should be the objective of, of all our praying is, is to is to get that thing solid inside of us. Uh, Colossians 4.12 says this, and you talk about, uh, Paul's talking about a guy named Epaphras. And Epaphras, he says, who is one of you, a servant of Christ greets you, always laboring fervently for you in prayers that you may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. This guy, Epaphras, he knew the key to unstoppable victory was to, to have people align with the will of God. Remember, if God is for you, who can be against you? When you are perfectly lined up, and this, that's, that's the key, when your will aligns with God's will, you can break the devil's will. And that's, that's the key. That's who can fight God's will and win. When you're, when you're working with God, who's God's for you, who can be against you? So let's, Jesus himself, he, he wrestled for this. He wrestled for this. And this is, this is very important because this is where people get the prayer like, God, your will, you know, uh, whatever your will is, you know, not my will, but your will be done. 
Most people misuse that. So Luke 22, verse 40 to 44, it says here that he was, um, Jesus was praying for God's will to be done, just like he taught his disciples to do. So, so this prayer was not a prayer based on, on ignorance. You know, uh, God, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do, but I don't know, but your will be done. I just don't know. No, he knew what God's will was. He knew what God's will was. And that's where the struggle was. There was, there was, a, there was a fight within his soul because he knew the cost. He knew the price, it would, it would, the toll it would take on his body, on his soul, uh, ultimately on his spirit. Ultimately on his spirit because he would have to give up his, his whole spirit um, when he was separated from the Father when he was on the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That was his spirit being separated, that spiritual death that was taking place on the cross. He, and on the cross, and that was the cost. He knew it. And he knew, he's like, if there's another way, let me know. But when, but his, but he, cause he knew the way. He knew the way. And so his prayer was not that he, I don't know the will. His prayer was, I know the will. If you, there's another way, let me know. But ultimately, he's, when he prayed, your will be done, he was seeking to be established and perfected in all the will of God. And after that third time when he prayed, he poured out his soul. His soul was cemented in line with God's will. And at that point, it was, at that point, it was an unstoppable path for victory. He no longer wavered at any point after that point. See, that's the, that's the object of our wrestling. It's not like, oh, I give up, I, you know, I, I surrender, I don't know what your will is, just, you know, let it, let, whatever happens, happens, let it be your will. No, your wrestling is, I want to know your will. And that's what Paul, in all of his prayers, it was very clear, like he was praying, is that, that you would know all the will of God, that, uh, that, that God would fill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power. It wasn't that they would be ignorant, it's that they'd be, they'd be filled with wisdom and the knowledge of his will. That was Paul's prayer. It's like, and, and that they would know the will and they would be able to walk in it. They would strength to walk in it because that was the path to victory. So, uh, again, our, our will must fit in God's will like a hand in glove. All right? So, again, this, and this is the key point. And again, going back to James 4, 7. You align your will with God's will, you can break the devil's will. The devil doesn't flee from God's will. He flees from your will. Did you hear that? He doesn't flee from God's will. He flees from your will. Amen? James 4, 7. Submit yourself, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he flee. Not from God, from you. From your will. Hallelujah. So, how do you strengthen your will? How do you strengthen your will in his will? Number one, first of all, you have to know and believe that he is working in you. Philippians 2, 2 through 13 says, Therefore, my beloved, as you've always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it's God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. So we have to let God's will work out of you, work out of you as he is working in you. So that word for for his God who works in you, but the willing to do, do of his good pleasure. That, that is uh, the word, um, the Greek word we get, ener energio, or to energize. This, and that, again, that's the same used in uh, Ephesians 3.20, where it talks about accord, according to the power that works in us. That word works is, again, ener energio. And again, energizes, according to the power that energizes us, for God who is who works, who energizes within you. God wants to energize you. So again, it's great to have desires, but the, it's the power to carry them out that's the issue. So again, we have to strengthen and feed our spirits. The key to, to winning a victory in battle is, is again, feeding your spirits. Because when you're, you're, greater is he that is in you than he that's in the world. So victory should be a foregone conclusion. But the key is sometimes the greatest strength we don't, we don't use, we don't emphasize, we don't feed. What you feed grows stronger. 
what you, what you starve grows weaker. Again, very basic. When you, when you don't feed your spirit, when you, uh, when you don't get in the word, when you don't pray, when you don't worship, and you just expect a, a sermon on Sunday morning to do everything for you. Again, that's good. That's wonderful. But that is not enough. You have to feed your spirit by yourself. And because your victories are not won on Sunday morning. Your victories are won throughout your daily life. And so the, when you feed your spirit continually, you'll have a continual cycle of victory. And so, because that's what energizes you. So it's like this. Uh, again, you remember the, when Jesus was tempted? He, again, very subtle, but he gave, he gave us the, the, the hidden key to victory there. He says, away from you, Satan, for you shall worship the Lord your God and him only you shall serve. Again, how do you serve him? You serve by doing his will. That's second. What was first? Worship the Lord your God. <laughs> Why? Well, why? Why is in the midst of your battle is you worship the Lord your God? Because when you worship the Lord your God, that's when his strength comes into you. His life comes into you. you. He's prepared a table before you in the presence of his enemies. He anoints your head with oil. Your cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy will follow you all the days of your life. You dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So that is when you uh, are in his presence, when you feed on his goodness, you, you, get, you eat from the table in the presence of his enemies, uh, in the presence of your enemies, by worshiping the, the Lord your God, you're, what you're doing is you're feeding your spirit and your spirit is rising to a place where it, can, it has all the energy it needs to overcome. It's like um, uh, the sun, like you turn toward the sun and the sun gets energy and you get energy, like the flower gets energy from the sun and then you can reflect that same energy and, and you can grow and overcome. Amen? So, uh, all right. So th these are things that, that when you get energy from, from praying, from reading the word, uh, you, it, choices become easy. Choices to, for God's will become very simple for you to do. Amen? Uh, so, uh, I, I kind of learned this when I was on the field with my teammates, all right? When I was on, on the mission field, there were times where, um, again, my natural feelings didn't, uh, you know, didn't feel like doing something, all right? So um, sometimes I didn't feel that, the, you know, the Spirit was doing something, and, but they made a choice based on the will of God. They had a place where they, their spirit was energized and, even, and they saw God's will and they just did it. And when they stepped out to do the will of God, amazing things start happening. I started seeing uh, amazing things happen, like, like people getting delivered, set free, people getting filled with the Holy Spirit. Um, and I didn't feel like there was a presence in the room and an anointing in the room, but God works with their, with their choices. And so when they start aligning their will with God's will, they were able to break the devil's will and see, and see God's will come to pass. Even in the spite of maybe the atmosphere didn't seem right for it to happen, or I didn't see how it could happen. It, because the enemy is always going to lie and say, no, God's will doesn't want to happen. It's, 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 everything's not lined up for that to happen. But when your spirit is energized, you can start seeing how God's will can happen, even though no one else feels that way. But you have a yes within your, your spirit to see things changes. And these people weren't perfect. You know, none of my teammates were, were perfect, had it all together, but they, they got a glimpse of God's will and they, they start believing, you know what? God can do this. I can, I'm, it's God's will. He wants to see it happen. I'm going to step out and see it and see it come to pass. And it, it did. And I learned something from that. I learned a powerful lesson of how to step out into God's will through that. All right, now the second most important this is, uh, is that is using um, and using the power of the recreated uh, man's will is the power of, in, is the issue of intent, intentionality over terminology. Intentionality over terminology. What does that mean? All right, so 1 Corinthians 2 4 says this In my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and power. Now, it's good to speak accurate words. We, we should speak accurate words, but there's something deeper than the surface that those words must carry. 
You know, whether you're, you're training, um, training a dog, training a toddler or a husband, uh, they don't always understand the, the English language that you are speaking. All right. But when there's an intentionality in the voice, uh, the message is communicated and things get done. Sit. Don't touch that. Uh, you know, uh, pick that up. Honey, does this temperature seem too cold in here? All right. They're, she's not asking you like to agree with her. Like, oh, yeah, that's, the temperature seems, yeah, it seems kind of cool. I agree with you. Now, she's not asking for agreement. What she's asking for you is to get your butt up and do something about that, that thermostat so this temperature is a little bit more livable. So there's an intentionality behind a voice. And so that it goes past language and compels a certain type of obedience. Okay, this is important. It, this, this issue of intention is critical. Um, this explains why Jesus uh, used some of the speech he did in certain situations um, because certain things that, that got done weren't, weren't done as precisely as described, prescribed by his words, okay? So when Jesus said, you know, be healed, you know, he, he didn't say, all right, he described all the, the medical terminology of everything that would need to happen for that to, to take place. Rise, take up your bed and walk. Um, so he didn't go into and, and say, uh, you know, I understand there is a spinal cord injury here and that uh, there's atrophy of the, the, the muscles here. He just said, be healed. So everything that would go online, the intentionality of everything that would, that would pertain to the healing of that body would take place from his will toward healing that person. This is very important because many times we're trying to speak so many things because we're trying to convince ourselves of God's will while we're praying, while we're speaking. That's why God says is like, you know, don't try to impress anyone by your much. You're not impressing God by your much speaking. I, I understand that sometimes that you have to get your heart out and that's all well and good. But God, who knows what you need before you ask, what he's looking for. That's why the parables, he talks so much about your attitude when you pray. You know, the, the parable of uh, the, the friend at midnight, um, you know, about persistence. We'll get to that in a second. But he, he talked about having a, a certain type of attitude when you pray because it's your intentions that make a big difference in prayers being answered or not, okay? So things like uh, when, when Jesus said, go show yourselves to the priests, that wasn't truly a command for healing but the intention was as they that there's no way they could do what they did unless healing took place like the very command the power to obey the power to make that thing happen was inherent in the intention of giving that command that's awesome and so uh we we see we see some of these examples when mary when it was at the uh, the, the uh, wedding, and she said, they have no more wine. And so Jesus didn't say, oh, that's good information. Uh, I was about to ready to go get a glass of myself. Uh, now I know, I, I guess I'll, uh, I'll go get maybe some water. Uh, wine's, wine's no longer on the menu. No, that's not what she was asking. Uh, she was not asking, uh, you know, giving information. There was intention, like, there's no wine. Do something about it. And so he got the message. And so he, and that's why he said, he says, woman, my time has not yet come. And she said, again, that intention within her heart. This is why Mary was actually a very powerful woman in the spirit. It's because she had, uh, she had a heart that had an intention behind it, a direction behind it. And she said to the servants, whatever he tells you to do, do it. it what was that intention? He talked to the servants, but the intention was like, God, Jesus, you're going to get something done here. And Jesus got the message. And the intention caused Jesus to, to enter into a miracle even before he was his time. That's amazing. So 
Uh, that is intentionality is the deep passion of the will to see something done. It's the thing that causes, even without a word, uh, demons are cast out. With the motions of the hand, waters part. With a look, things happen. Hallelujah. This is why a high percentage of uh, communication is nonverbal. Because um, intentionality is the driving force behind the human will. Uh, again, we, we go back to Mark 11, verse, verse 23. Uh, 24 says, Whatever things you desire when you pray, believe you receive them, you will have them. So I, I, I love the Word of Faith message. I really believe in the, the power of faith. But what causes faith to come to to, to come to pass is, is not just believing, but the desire. The desire puts, puts faith into action. If there's no desire, I'm going to say your faith is really just a form and no power in it. It's that desire to say, I really want to see this mountain moved. My desire, there's things I desire to see that are not happening. Therefore, I, when I desire, I pray, I believe, I receive, and those things will happen. That desire causes that. It, it's, <laughs> it's not faith that causes the mountain to move. It's your will. Your will and the, the desire behind that's pushing your will in that direction. That ultimately is what causes the mountain to move. Amen? Amen. So it's that little requirement of your nature. And, and this is where we start getting into uh, things about uh, uh, whatever, whatever God's will is and that you see in, in the Word of God. Um, whether it's, it's healing, whether it's prosperity, whether it's, it's uh, salvation of, of family members, of seeing uh, justice happen, of seeing righteousness come to pass, of, of seeing, um, uh, so this is where like when you want then your nation to be changed, your, uh, your community to be changed. Again, that's, there's a battle there. And your intentionality is what's going to make the difference. Your intention, like see, I will see God's will done. Again, going back to Luke, uh, sorry, Mark 11, um, early in the chapter, when Jesus, he had desire for figs. He had a desire for those figs. And again, there was no figs on the tree. And he said, let no one eat figs from you ever again. Again, it's a very odd scripture, but there, there's a lot of truth hidden in, in that. And then the next day, walk by, and it was withered up, and that led into the discussion about faith moving mountains. And, and so he didn't just, he didn't command, like, a tree, I command you to be cursed. He, he, his desire says, no one eats figs from you ever again. And that, that desire, um, where his intention is like, and Jesus said, let your yes be yes, but there's no be no. And he said, no one eat figs from you ever again. And he walked away and he knew his word was as good as done, that that would take place, that that tree would, would no longer be a problem. And so when your will, when you can say something and you know for a fact that it will be done and your will, like you're finding sickness in your body, you're like, this thing will not, will not survive. This sickness will not uh, prosper. No weapon formed against me will prosper. These, uh, this attacks from my, my neighbors, my family, they, they, they will subside. Um, I, we will overcome by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of our testimony. And you just know it, and then you say it, and you walk away, and you know without a fact that it will be done, that all heaven will bend circumstances to see uh, your, because your will partner with God's will to see it come to pass. That's awesome. That's amazing. Um, and I, I'm going to end here with the, the, the last thing. Um, I have a lot more to, here to say, but uh, the, the third way, the third way, the authority of nature of the recreated will is manifested is through persistence. So again, the first way is knowing that you are uh, created in God's image and know that he is working in you, his good pleasure. You know that he's working in you. Number two is that the, the intentionality, the issue of intentionality over verbs, over, over the, the words you use. So your intent, the intention of your heart is, is powerful. And number three, persistence. Again, uh, this should come more easily when, when intentionality is established. So, but you're, just understand that your faith will be tested. 
it will be tested and God wants you to come through as gold. So testing doesn't, doesn't uh, uh, um, uh, make you, it reveals you. Testing reveals you. Um, yeah, so gold is still gold before it goes through the fire. The fire just reveals that it, yeah, that it really is gold. That there is, um, and faith is still faith in spite of opposition and after the opposition. It's just revealed after the opposition that that was true faith. And rather than just a facade or wishing or happy thoughts, all right? And so faith is, when it comes to a trial, it, it doesn't change. It says this, it says the end from the beginning, the alpha, the, the alpha and the omega. That's what faith is. It establishes those things. So again, much has been written in uh, motivational quotes concerning the virtues of persistence. Uh, and, and again, the power of persistence has, has been seen glimpses of God's word, you know, where the power of the human will manif is manifested in persistence, has proven even to change what seems to be God's plans. So persistence breaks resistance and demonstrates the ultimate end of authority over uh, the, the authority of the human will over circumstances. All right. So again, we, we see this again, where the woman with the issue of blood from Mark 5, all right? So that's a story where Jesus, where Jesus was um, walking through a crowd, other crowd was pressing around him, and this woman with the issue of blood, she's, and he's had it for like 12 years, and she came up behind him, and she says, if I can only touch his garment, I will be healed. And so Jesus was walking by. The will of God was passing by. And she was not going to get her miracle. She was, if she just said, well, if it was God's will, you know, Jesus would, he would stop the crowds. Oh, the will of God needs to be done. Let's do it right now. No, the will of God was passing by. She had to reach out and grab it herself. As she reached out and grabbed it, that will of God of healing passed through uh, Jesus' body. That power went through and healed her. She stole a miracle, and that was through the power of persistence. She, in, her, in her own mind, she said, if I know what God's will is, I know God's will is for me to be healed. I've, seen, I've heard the stories of this good Jesus that heals, that sets people free. I've heard all this. That is God's will. I want that for myself. And so she pressed through the crowd. She grabbed a hold of his garment, and she got healed. And so her persistence get, got her healing. Uh, her persistence got the will of God done. Um, again, there, this could be applied to a lot of different um, things that the Bible promises, um, but healing is a very clear one in, in the scripture. And many times we, we see that people, they don't, they don't always believe in healing because like if God wants something to be healed, it would happen. And sometimes persistence is the necessary ingredient persistence and believing what God's will is and pressing through to see this thing come to pass and not just hoping and praying and wishing. It's persisting and saying, ah, this thing shall come to pass. I, I will stand my ground in, in this thing and I will not accept maybe. I don't accept might be. I only accept it shall be. All right. Uh, Centurion from Matthew 8. Centurion from, from Matthew 8. This is, this is interesting. Jesus made a plan to come to his house. He says, you know, if you're, uh, I, can you come pray for my servant that he'd be, uh, you know, um, he heal my servant. And she said, okay, I'll come to your house. And you said, Centurion said, no, you don't even need to, to come to my house. All you need to do is speak the word. My servant will be healed. Uh, and so the miracle that happened did not come from Jesus' mouth. He, said, he says, as you have believed, so it, so it shall be done. Isn't that interesting? He, so it was actually not Jesus' word that healed him, but the centurion's word. The centurion's word was what healed the servant. So the centurion, he persisted in uh, the understanding that, hey, if you speak, if you speak the word, it shall come to pass. And he said, if you hold on to that, hold on to that word, it's going to come to pass. And the centurion just said, okay, I'm believing that. And he, the centurion walked away and he got home and the servant was healed at that very hour. He, he persisted uh, just in the faith that, that God's word was enough to get that thing done. All right. 
Hallelujah. Um, I'm telling you some of my favorite stories. Uh, Mark 7, Syrophoenician woman, uh, you know, when he's, Jesus said, um, um, well, she asked that the demon possessed, her demon possessed daughter would be healed. And Jesus just ignored her, kept walking. These are instances where it looks like God's will is not coming to pass. It looks like what the people wanted and what God wanted were completely different. So in this circumstance, uh, what the Syrophoenician woman wanted, it was God's will, but didn't look like it was God's will. It didn't look from Jesus' attitude, it didn't look like it. So what she, she, he says, it's not right to, the right to take the children's bread and cast the little dogs. And she said, yes, Lord, but even the little dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the children's table. And Jesus says, for this saying, go your way. The demon's gone out of your daughter. And so this is, and he says, again, woman, great is your faith. He said that to her. And it's because she persisted in the face of opposition. She persisted with her will in the face of opposition. She says, yes, I'm still pressing in, even though it looks like you just said no. But no, I still know what God's will is. Past what those circumstances are, are saying. Past what, what other people are saying. Past what the disciples are saying. Past what, what uh, my friends and neighbors are saying. I still know what God's will is in this circumstance. There's something within me that knows God is good. He has enough power to get this done, and I'm not going to quit till see this come to pass. Hallelujah. So as we close here, we'll talk about winning a battle. You have a choice. You have the power through the recreate will to make overwhelming choices. Overwhelming choices that make a huge difference. And don't let the enemy deceive you and say, you don't have a choice. You can't make a choice. You have no power to make a decision in this. It, your decision is in other people's hands. No. Your ability to win the battle is in your hands. If God is for you, who can be against you? But the key to, to overwhelming victory is, again, to align your will with God's will. And you, you press through. Know that He's working in you to work out that will. He's working in you, and he's, and, and, but you have to get that inside of you that says, even beyond my, all my words, I'm fully convinced. Just like Abraham, I was, I'm fully convinced in this will. He's worked in me. He's energized me. I know I'm fully convinced this is God's will. And I'm, I'm not trying to convince myself by, by arguing a lot or speaking a lot. I just know that I know that I know. And even no matter what I say or, or do, I don't have to say the perfect thing or I don't have to do the perfect thing, but I'm walking in the direction of seeing this thing to come to pass as if it already has come to pass. Uh, my words don't have to be perfect. My terminology isn't perfect. My, uh, my actions don't have to be perfect. I just know that I know that I know that this thing will be done. And because of that, I persist. I don't quit. I, no matter what the opposition, no matter if it seems like, <laughs> like if I know it's God's will, even if it looks like all these no's, God's word says yes, God's spirit says yes, and that's enough. That's enough. And you can, you can win the victory because of it. And you won't quit. You won't quit. Father, we thank you right now for the ability to win the battle, that we have the power uh, you've given us power through the recreated uh, human spirit. You've, created, you've given us a will, a power to make choices, to say yes and to say no, and to see heaven, uh, what we bind on earth is bound in heaven. What we loose on earth is loosed in heaven. And it's by our choice. Show us the choices we have. Reveal to us your will. Reveal it to us so we can choose it, so we can choose it and see it come to pass no matter what the opposition. In Jesus' name, we speak it to be so. Amen. 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 Well, God bless you guys. I thank you for uh, sticking around. And, and uh, we, we look forward to uh, come visit us here at, at our church. We meet in, in person on Sunday mornings. And we, we look forward to seeing you. All right. Bless you. Have a great day.